Welcome back, Inebriates. This is Andy of the Inebriate Podcast, and once again, recording from my uh, safety of my apocalypse bunker. And uh, today, we actually have Adeline, uh, a musician, with Hello. us. Hello. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, how 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 do you fare? Uh, I was actually while I was waiting for you to come on, I was actually. Our governor just announced uh, the new like opening uh, strategy for our state, so it was kind of like people freaking out online, and you know why can't I be open that sort of thing. I, what's what, what are you experiencing? Uh, and where are you? I'm not even sure. I was just about to ask you the same question. I'm in New York City. I'm in Brooklyn. Okay, uh, I am in Plymouth, Massachusetts, home of the Pilgrims. Okay. Um, but so we're not too far apart. And um, yeah, so I know New York was hit pretty hard. We've been talking to a lot of people out there. So uh, have they announced plans to kind of get things going again? I, well, the last I heard was um, extending until the lockdown until June 13th. Okay. I don't want to. Right, false rumors, but I think that is this is the latest uh, that we heard of, of a few days ago. Yeah, I was talking um, to someone from LA. They're shut down till August first already. Yeah, that's what the mayor of LA just apparently announced. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And New York, I, I mean, I guess we're extended until yeah mid June. So which, which let's see. Too far away, I guess. I don't know. Um. So we've talked to a lot well, of musicians. It's like, it's, oh, go ahead. It's mm-hmm. like, no, no, no. I mean, you know, we could go on and on about this. <laughs> so I would, I'm actually, I prefer hearing oh, all sure. your next question. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, we were talking to a lot of people and who were on tour and in the studio. So what did you have going? What what were you doing two months ago? Well, I have to say things sort of, I mean, and and this is um, sort of my way of looking at the world in general. I try to see the bright side, you know, because there's always one. Sometimes it's hard to see it. But what worked out in my favor is that I had a release plan all mapped out Mm -hmm. and um, we we could continue forward with that. And somehow I feel like having music ready to be released. was a good thing in the end because people were even more so ready to listen to new music. Um, so somehow this is the bright side, right? I had like, I, I released a single uh, early March and then a single mid uh, April and just released a single last week. And I feel like um, people were really attentive yeah. and that was already planned. Um, I had of course a small tour planned and some shows um, that's not happening, but there's nothing we can do about that. So right, but are, are you still <laughs> finding ways to get out there and promote it? Are you? I mean, you know, podcasts. But are, are you getting to perform at all? Uh, I know a lot of people are performing online. Mm-hmm. Well, there's you know there's the usual um, new form format, which is you know live stream shows with Zoom, Facebook Live, and uh, you know Instagram Live. Although I haven't really done a full on Instagram Live show, it just seems difficult with the sound quality. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've done, I've done some of those. What's been um, transpiring the most for me is, is just creating content. I realized that, one, again, due to timing, it was sort of necessary for me to come up with visuals for my music anyway. And I think if it wasn't for this situation, I probably wouldn't have done even half of it, which is, you know, um, a video for Twilight and a video for After Midnight, my last two singles and it's funny because um, two months ago I would have told you, wow, you know, there are artists out there that like direct on videos. Like it's amazing. I don't think I'm that person. I'm not good with visuals. <laughs> and you know, I went from that to six weeks later, I've made three videos by myself. So, you know, I might look back in five years and look at those videos and think, wow, we were really desperate, <laughs> but oh. At least, you know, it's pushing my creativity. So there you go. <laughs> but I, I think that's um, a great thing. I think that's when sometimes when we're most creative, when we're kind of put in that position, we don't have a choice and we have to do something new. 
Absolutely. Do, do you, when you're writing your music, do you have any kind of visual in mind or like, how did you take your music and, and transform it into a video when it's not kind of your forte? Uh, well, I, I just sort of, and, and it's a new side of me that I'm discovering uh, that I didn't know before. And there really is something like what you said when you, you know, you have to figure it out and somehow artists um, is when we get to that certain place that we're something opens up and we, we kind of start seeing things a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just sort of, um, I think I started from the emotion of the song and what the lyrics were about. And I tried to think, uh, okay, how do I want um, the song? What do I want to convey with the song in terms of, um, you know, emotion and translate that into, into visuals. So and tried my so, best. <laughs> was it a similar experience to like how you write a song? Were you um, to, you I know, guess so. That's your... Something similar it is I found that I, uh, and this is why this is probably some, something that I'm going to continue doing mm-hmm. in the future. Um, because I found that, you know, it's, it's something, a similar process to when I'm creating a song, which is, once you're getting into that creative zone, it's like opening a door and entering a new space and being completely, um, being completely drawn into that space and just getting completely what we call in the zone, right? Right, right. And I, found, I sort of found that zone with, with creating these videos. I remember for After Midnight, I mean, I just really did it in my bedroom with a bunch of like fun pieces from our wardrobe and but I, I, I had to choreograph the whole thing because I wanted to do a one shot and I just really got in a zone. Like I, I was in the room and it was a mess and there were clothes here and there. And I was really in a zone. My husband tried to walk in that. He was like, Whoa, I can't even like, this is a, <laughs> what is going on here. Uh, he turned back around really quickly. <laughs> so it was a similar process in terms of that part of the process where you can't really explain because it's, it's purely, um, uh, emotion based and, and just more so based on inspiration and being connected in that, that moment that also I find on stage, you know, uh, the piece that we don't control basically. <laughs> yeah. It, it's so funny. Like how sometimes you'll have like the smallest nugget of an idea. And then as you kind of, you know, with an artist, there'll be paint everywhere. And, and, uh, I've, you know, I'm not completely, inexperience of music and I've seen people kind of, you know, they kind of, you know, they can hear it in their head and they're kind of like mumbling and they're playing a couple things and they're trying to find the right next note or, or, or mm-hmm. series of notes. And it doesn't sound like anything. No. The, it's, the video experience was the same thing where it doesn't look like anything's going on other than a mess. Exactly. It, and it's, it, you know what, it, what you're describing reminds me of um, from my personal experience is my voice notes. You know, when I come up with a melody yeah. and I grab my phone and it, it, there's mumbles and words. And sometimes I don't think anybody could make up what melody I'm doing. Actually, that same song, After Midnight, uh, I remember that I came up with a melody on the train. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, we, I usually make the music first and I left the studio to go home and I heard the melody. <laughs> And I just, I, I, I have the voice note and I have like two guys sitting next to me speaking Spanish. And I was like, <laughs> I can hear myself. Na, 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 na. <laughs> and the track, doo, doo. I mean, you know, it's very similar to walk into my room with all my coals on the floor. <laughs> and sometimes it's almost just to kind of trigger that memory in your head. Cause like, I'm a super note taker, but if you look at my mm-hmm. notes, it looks like complete gibberish. You know, mm. like a name a couple of numbers but like i can look at it and i'm like okay that's the thing that i have to do and and so it, it's almost like these weird kind of like anchor points that you're just trying to mm-hmm. click in your brain to to reignite yeah. that moment um do you get a lot of inspiration on the train or is like where do you find you get the most uh it's happened <laughs> on yeah. the train i mean i'm i'm i know that a lot of people non musicians and uh have asked me you know they have the, they fantasize a little bit our our writing process do you walk on the street and hear something and 
that's not really how it goes for me so much. You know, I'm not going to look in the fields and like feel a song. I wished it, it, it was so romantic, but yeah. it's not as romantic. Um, it, sometimes it happens, but it, it, generally the song starts with the music. And because I'm a bass player, it starts with a groove. You know, we start with the drums and the groove first and then come the, the keys I just kind of have a skeleton and try not to polish the instrumental too much to leave room for um, the, the melody. But I do the, the, the kind of um, very instinctive part is the melody coming up. Like, and I've, I've been trying this new exercise with uh, songwriting where I just, as soon as I hear the music, okay, I got to go in the booth and just either with my phone or, you know, go in the booth and record a freestyle. Mm -hmm. And very lately it's been, it's been the song. I just kind of. So you just kind of freestyle the lyrics like off that. the top of your head kind of thing. I freestyle the melody and the oh. lyrics are complete gibberish. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but there are sounds there that I try to, when, and then later on I write to that, I write lyrics to that melody. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do is I, I'll just like completely let it, I try to really find that same space again, where it's, it's all in instinct base and based. And I just let it, whatever is coming to me, come out, you know, without controlling it, without thinking of it, uh, of what I'm doing. And then after that, we re-listen and we kind of like create the song from there because some parts of, oh, this is obviously more of a chorus melody. This is more of a verse. Sometimes it takes a few try, but I did a, uh, this exercise lately where I tried to just not change anything, just make a song with whatever you just, the first idea that comes out. That's been pretty interesting to do. Do you think that that kind of improvisational letting it out, let it just kind of happen, do you think that's something, because it, it, it reminds me of like little kids make up songs all the time, mm -hmm. you know? I did. <laughs> so, so do you think it's something that we had in like, as we get older, kind of people shut it off and then it's trying to unlock that again? Absolutely. I mean, I'm a firm believer that we are born magical beings in a certain way. And, and then we grow up and society trims it all out to make us conform with the way things are. And then we spent our adult life trying to find that person again. <laughs> the, my best Lesson in that, the way I, I started really realizing is I had that singing teacher who um, his whole um, motto was, was, we know how to sing naturally. We know how to breathe naturally. Look at a baby. They breathe with their diaphragm. They, that's why they have these, you know, big little round, beautiful bellies. Yeah. And the best example he gave me is like, you hear kids screaming all night. They scream all night, all day. They're playing, they scream. They never come home hoarse with, mm -hmm. you know, hurting their vocal cords. We naturally have the placement. We naturally have the confidence. We have all of these things. And then it's, you know, as, a, as an artist, for me, the biggest um, challenge was, as a singer, for instance, was to find that breathing technique that I was born with, you know, right. to reef. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. Like, if you look at, at kids, like, even just something as simple as they don't have sleep issues because they just go until they're completely exhausted and pass out. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I found myself the busier I get, the easier I sleep because it's like, you're working mm -hmm. hard. You're so busy. And when you lay down, I mean, sometimes you have to learn to shut your brain off, but yeah, um, you know, when you're exhausted, your body's just like, cool, we're going to sleep. And you know, all night been uh -huh. really not so much, but you know, um, yeah. So what's the trick? What's the trick to getting to be a kid again? Oh my God. I don't know. <laughs> you have to ask some sort of meditative guru or someone, something like, I don't, I mean, I, for my own um, story, you know, I, I yeah. feel like I'm lucky that I do some, I spent most of my time doing something that I love. Um, so I feel like a kid because I'm, you know, 
I don't work. I have fun. So it's what you describe. I go to sleep and I'm like, oh, I had a fun day. I played all day. I played bass and wrote songs. And um, so I think, I guess I would say the most important thing is to try and spend most of our time doing something we love, which is difficult, you know, when mm-hmm. people have jobs they don't love. And I, um, you know, feel a lot of sympathy for that. So it's difficult to, to give an advice or lesson on that, you know? Uh, so one question that I feel I always have to ask and I hate asking because it's so, it's, it's just such a crap question is <laughs> like, how would you describe your music? And, and I've had this conversation with multiple people and it's like, you know, back in the day you used to go into the record store and like rock was over here. Country was in the middle mm-hmm. rap was over there. And I feel like nowadays it, it would just be a mess. It would just be like, we're doing it alphabetical and you, you find what you're looking for. So mm-hmm. we, we've been asking people who, like what household name artist would you go on tour with that would make sense to kind of give our listeners oh. an idea of what to expect from your music? Uh, um, artists of today? No, it can be anybody. Just, I mean, living or dead, I suppose. I mean, it, just something that kind of... I like- mean, I guess my heroes, I don't even think I'm worthy enough to be on the same stage so i won't even name them uh i mean my musical heroes um are prince shaka khan uh aretha franklin and curtis mayfield yeah um that's like kind of like my i think these are the people that listen to the most uh but you know today i would my dream bill um would be anderson pack and the free nationals I don't um, think I know them. You don't know Anderson Pack? You know Anderson Pack. I'm sure you know Anderson yeah, Pack. Maybe I just don't know him by name. Yeah, you have to. He's, he's a he's a well. He's he's a good example because it's, he doesn't really fit in one genre. He sings rap, but he's an incredible rapper, mm-hmm. and he's a ridiculous drummer. Um. So he and he, but he. He's on stage, he leaves the drums and starts dancing and crowd surfing and his band behind him is, I mean, they're all amazing and they're very sweet guys. Um, and he just kind of, you can feel all, you can hear all the different references in, in his music. Um, I mean, I don't know who else. I, I, there's, I feel like there's so many different uh, artists that I'd love to, op- you know, I think I could fit with Leon Bridges or Gary Clark Jr., but also probably... Um, uh, Lion Babe, you know. Yeah. Or I mean, Crumble. Have you, have, you part- have you gotten to participate in any um like festival style concerts? Because I, I find those yeah. are fun to kind of. Afro punk. You know, Erica Badu also would be a great one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I played Afro punk the year that Erica Badu headlined, and so that was you know, that was great. I love yeah. love her so. Um, yeah, Afro punk, and we played um, a few festivals, but uh, you know, um, Funk on the Rocks, which is the festival that the band Chromeo puts together at, at um, Red Rocks, which was a dream come true for me. To oh, play you there. played at Red Rocks? That's mm-hmm. a gorgeous. Yeah. Place. Last exactly a year ago, actually. Yeah, how was that? It was and, unbelievable. Yeah, that's one of those places. I remember the first time I saw it, I'm like, I want to see a show there. It's so cool. Have you seen the show there? I haven't, but it's on my list, you know? Hopefully. It'll happen. We'll have shows again. <laughs> I'm sure we will. I mean, it's going to take some time, but um, it's just one of those places. You know, it, it's just such a cool venue. Um, it's unbelievable. So clearly you've toured a bit. Uh, have you gone all over the world or just in the States? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, not necessarily so much with my solo project, even mm-hmm. even though I I was lucky to play in Japan uh, last year, which was another amazing, amazing, uh, you know, place to to perform um, and a beautiful trip. But yeah, between like my former band Escort and um, I play bass for Cedo Green, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, we traveled a bunch with him. We played in Brazil a few, a couple times. We played in Argentina, uh, and we played in Europe a lot last summer. And then with my band escort, I've also been many places. So we, yeah, I've traveled a lot traveling. 
Oh, playing music, yeah. Yeah. What what's the the one place that you feel like was surprisingly um I don't want, accepting's not the right word, but like really really into music and kind of exp- experiencing live and new music. Was it, is it like one place that stands out? Um I would say the two places that really um offered me such an amazing perspective on how people um, experience a show mm-hmm. um, that were completely different. It's Portugal. Okay. And Brazil, similarly, um, just the level of attentiveness that people have to the show in, in the sense where they're, they're partying with you. They're yeah. with you. Uh, Portugal is one of my favorite places in the world. And, um, it, it was just unbelievable the level of support. I, we had this amazing show one night where my bandmate uh, was celebrating his birthday, mm-hmm. and the venue found out and they bought a cake for him and brought it on stage, and the entire audience sang happy birthday to him, but oh, with so much heart and like it was, it was amazing. Um, and then Japan will be my second one in in terms of how they listen to the music. Um, it, it, it felt very different from playing a show in, in New York um, or, you know, the U.S. or anywhere in Europe, really, where, and it's not better or, or, diff, or worse, it's just different. Yeah. Um, I experienced that people were listening to the song and clapping at the end of the song, not during, and just were really, really, really listening, which at first was like, wow. I feel like I'm being... <laughs> scrutinized and a you know fine tooth comb but yeah. it, it, and it was incredibly pleasant too it felt more like um it really felt like i was creating art in front of people it felt almost like a museum a little bit so were they pretty much quiet during the performance quiet during the songs yeah. completely quiet it's so and weird. in between the clap yeah yeah the, those those weird like cultural differences that you don't think about mm-hmm. and uh, yeah I was watching, uh, I think it was a stand-up comedian. I can't remember. And he was playing in in like Finland or or Norway or something like that. And when the crowd clapped, they would start to clap like you would normally would. But by the end of their clapping, they would all be clapping in sequence. Oh, that's amazing. It was really weird. And the first time you're like, okay, that's weird. And then they just kept doing it like through the whole performance. And it was just. That's so cool. Yeah. It was very strange. So I don't know if it was like a cultural thing or just some weird audio glitch, but uh, it's, it's always. That's awesome. See how, how, you know, those little, little differences that you wouldn't even think to tell anybody that just kind of pop up. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, why bass? Why bass? Um, yeah. It happened on accident. <laughs> like all the best things, right? Yeah. Um, I was playing guitar. I've been playing guitar since I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Not really well. Uh, and I, my first band in New York was called The Crowd. It was a, a trio, me and two rappers. And we all played instruments. And I was playing guitar. And we had a show scheduled. And we hired a bass player and a drummer. And the bass player canceled at the last minute. And the guys were like, hey, Adeline, you play guitar. Why don't you just play bass? Put a bass in my hand. <laughs> and you're and like, okay. Yeah. I fell in love completely. And my yeah. life changed after that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Do you, because I generally feel like that's the, the, especially when you're younger, that's the way bands go. It's like, you find the guitar player and, and the singer and then, you know, the bass player and drummer almost always seem to be like an afterthought and like, Oh, I know guitarists that, you know, will play bass or something like that. Do you feel that bass is um, underappreciated? Uh, I don't know. Cause I'm, I mean, yes, it is in a mm-hmm. sense, because I, I'm, I know and I've experienced that most people who are not musicians um, or not really versed in the musical language, which I can't blame them at all, um, you know, look at a bass and think it's a guitar, which it is a guitar, but they don't know the difference between a bass guitar and a, right. and a guitar. Um, but I think that the bass mentality and the 
personality that a lot of bass players share, um, it's okay. We don't care about, we're not here to, I mean, there are some shiny bass players. I'm, I'm, I'm one of them, I guess, because I'm fronting and kind of, you know, um, singing at the same time, that kind of, uh, you know, and you think of Larry Graham and Bootsy Collins, you know, these guys are not happy. They're not going to be in standing. Bootsy Collins background. is not a wallflower. He's definitely not a wallflower. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, even even these men, I think you know they're they're happy with being in the front, and people know their bass players. You know what I mean. And I guess the rest, the rest, I, I really feel like you know the best bass mentality is I, like I'm chilling. You know. Yeah. Uh, so it's okay. I I can let the guitar player shine unless you're Bootsy and you make your you know you make your way. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I was kind of looking you up online. I don't normally do research, but when I talk to musicians, I kind of like to know what style they play and, and hear some of their music. Did I see that you did an NPR Tiny Desk concert? I wish. Oh, I did man. not. We did the contest. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, Tiny Desk every year. Because um, the, the video important. didn't look like the Tiny Desk area, so I wasn't sure if it was... Yeah. It's our, it's, it was at our studio. I mean, at my, my bandmate studio. Uh, and we, we were on the desk. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. They have requirements that you have to have a desk in the room and that it has to be sort of similar. Um, but it was fun doing, you know, and we were like, Oh, you know, this, this, again, this is a opportunity to create some content and, and just have that video. If they yeah. don't pick us, which they didn't, then they picked someone amazing. So, so oh, good. They they have like a contest to or like a submission type process. Yeah, 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 yeah. They do every year. Um, artists can submit their videos, and they they'll pick their best one, and that person is actually later on invited to perform on the actual tiny desk. Uh, a few bands have, you know, uh, bro- broken a little bit like that. Uh, Tank and the Bengas. I don't know if you know them. I don't think they're I really know them. cool, and they they uh, won the contest, and their tiny desk was so dope. They they've gotten much bigger since. Yeah. It, it's such a cool format and cool way to find out about other bands. It, it's, it, it's really neat. Actually, Anderson Pack, the artist I was mentioning is to this day, still the artist that has the most views on tiny desk. No kidding. So you definitely I, go watch. It I probably have stumbled across it then. I, it, his name probably just doesn't ring a bell. It's the best. It really is the best one. In my opinion. So you you've been kind of, strong-armed into making your own videos is this something that you're going to do from now on uh i might i might keep doing it i think i uh i'm gonna have to find the balance between okay now i can definitely bring the level up and when i have some money again (laughs) and i can invest and when i can get out again and be with other people i would love to i'm all you know i believe in delegating and you know, if I can find a, a director that can do it, um, that I believe in and whose vision aligns with mine, then I think I will do that. So, but the one difference for sure is that I will be much more involved, um, yeah. much more involved now from now on. Yeah. And how do you, cause we were talking about content and kind of creating videos as part of that. Um, it sounds like you've been playing for quite a while. Do you, how has like social media and YouTube changed the business? Um, I, I've talked with artists who are like, I don't like social media, but I feel obligated to have to do it in order to promote my band. You know, is it a chore or is it something that you embrace? It's both. It's That's both. Fair. Yes, you can see it be both. It's, it's totally both. It's at times, um, <laughs> feels like such a chore because I realized there some days I'm like, wow, I spent so much time strategizing and working on it. I should be spending this time making music. Yeah. Um, it just takes away from the focus. There's sometimes I'm in the studio and I'm trying to accomplish something and I'm getting emails from my manager to remind me to post this or that. Uh, and that's when it really is a chore, but you know, I, I hated it when it's when when Instagram really became a thing, I, I was really um, resistant and I didn't like it at all. I just didn't like what it was showing about the music business. And, and 
people and also I was kind of a victim of it a little bit at the time because my band Escort had reached like a really, really good place and we had some success and um, then Instagram came out and we didn't, we fell into in the cracks. Our success mm -hmm. didn't translate into Instagram followers because we, we were there right before. So okay. somehow we had a lot, we have, we, we would sell out, um, we would sell out venues of 800 people, no problem, but had like 5,000 followers on our Instagram. And we, we missed out on a lot because people would look at our Instagram following and think, Oh, this band cannot be really successful. They're not doing well. So that was tricky. And at the time I was really feeling a little sad about it and really frustrated. Um, but you got to live with your times and, you know, um, with my solo career, the Instagram, I've, I've kind of been working hard at it and it's now I'm seeing it as a platform to be able to communicate with people directly. And, and the way I see it now is, well, it's my page, it's my platform and I can do whatever I want with it. Yeah. And if I want to just talk about my music, at least I have a place where I can do that. It's better than not having that, you know? It considering that, that music <laughs> it seems so strange that people judge artists by how many followers they have do you feel that that kind of thing can cause you to not get booked somewhere if they're like oh she doesn't have the, the oh i know it doesn't cause you to be booked that is a fact it, it it really is and this is what changed and it's not just instagram it's also now it that was taken another step further with the streaming numbers and you know i'm sure you know that then now the most relevant thing is how many monthly listeners you have on spotify oh yeah yeah we get asked frequently but you know exactly for someone to be like well you know what's your reach what's your downloads and this that and the other. yeah Which i understand because i mean people don't want to waste their time and and talk to someone that's no one else is hearing um but it should not be the only um, the only factor. And that's when it, it's a problem Yeah, is, you know, um, someone looking at my numbers and thinking, yeah, you know, it doesn't mean I can't deliver a killer show because I can definitely assure you that I can. Right. <laughs> um, and you know, just like your show, I don't care. I mean, I don't, actually don't even know how much outreach you guys have. And that's, I, <laughs> I'm just happy and honored to be invited, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's tricky, but it, it is a huge factor, if not the number one, you know, and most people, most people, decision makers in, in the art world, I mean, we know that they're not, they're not artists. So right. they just look at the data, they look at the facts and that's what, that's what, that's how they make decisions. Is that sort of thing, like Spotify is kind of the, the, default or pandora that type of thing what about radio play i mean is that does radio still exist in the way that it used to do people concern themselves it with radio play? Still makes a big difference in someone's career to get radio play but it's yes. even harder now because this whole streaming world as much as it's um given platform and more opportunities to indie and quote unquote, smaller artists, it's also given more power to major labels. Um, so, you know, they rule, they kind of rule the business with radio play as well. Yeah. Um, and people still listen to the radio. It is still a big, big platform. I feel like once the kind of social media started to monetize, you know, advertising and, and YouTube's changed a lot. I think that's what brought a lot of the big business back into it because they have the money behind it to kind of, you know, if you're a smaller band, you're like, okay, I can throw a little bit of money behind yeah, you know, video or whatever, but the, you know, the major companies can just throw tons of money. I saw that just a, a few days ago, we decided to run a, a small, really minor campaign on, um, the post I did to advertise for my new single. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you look, you go into Instagram and you, I don't know if I should be telling that to the audience, but it's okay. Everybody has a platform, you know, has a, a page so they can all figure it out for themselves. 
but you look and you, you can add, like you can do $5 a day, $6 a day. And as you add more money, you can see the outreach of people. Right. But what I could afford, it's like, okay, like up to 200,000 people. And then you, you scroll all the way up and you have the option of a thousand people and you're reaching like in the, a million people. Yeah. And that, that's how, that says it all. Yeah. It, it's, it's so, it's so interesting to, to, it, and then it's like, sometimes like we, we've done um, ads for our local events and you can really um, focus them on, you know, like, okay, we're, we're just going to do in the Plymouth area or, you know, just, people between this age range, you can really kind of like dial down to like what your demographic is, which can be Mm -hmm. useful, but I don't know. It's, it, it, I always felt for us particularly, it's been very hit or miss. Like sometimes we'd throw money behind something and it wouldn't really take off. And other times Mm -hmm. we'd have a huge turnout and it was just through word of mouth. So it's, it's, I don't think there's any real hard and fast rule. No. And, and it's good because I mean, in a sense, the, the, the bright side is that, people still choose what they want to listen to or are here. And, and if people gravitate towards something, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's their vision, their feelings, and we have to respect that. Yeah. So, you know, cause I'm sure there are so many things that major labels or giant companies try that don't really take because people don't, you know, we're not, we're not following sheep either, you know? Um, so I trust, I trust that, organically things can happen as well. And that's, that's, that's why I think for the, for the top tier, things haven't changed much. If anything, they make more money now, probably, yeah. I mean, less in some areas, but more in some areas, but at least it's, it, it is good for us indie artists because, you know, this is in the seventies. And if you weren't signed to Motown, then you weren't going to do anything or signed to a, a certain size label you know at least we can have our own platform i can have my music out and someone can check out the discover weekly playlist and and hear my song and think oh i'm gonna follow her i like this so that's the that's the bright side yeah and i and from being a music fan i think it's a lot easier to share music with my friends now opposed to being Mm -hmm. like oh you gotta check out this guy and hope they do or Mm -hmm. loan them a cd and hope you get it back you can oh my god i lost so many cds right right and you know I, I can remember in high school you know being the goofy guy you'd loan it to the the cute girl in class and she never oh, yeah. it. And you'd be like oh damn it oh my god i have been there too i have like, <laughs> loaned a cd to a guy i had a crush on i remember that one guy he never gave it back to me and then he yeah. had another girlfriend how rude yeah <laughs> at least give the cd back um, but now you can just send a link, you know, and, um, yeah. cause I'm forever sending my kids, uh, music links, uh, especially my son, my son's a big music fan. So, Great. so how old is he? uh, he will be 18 in about 20 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he's, he's oh. an adult. What does he like? I'm wondering what an 18 year old is into. Uh, so he, it's, it's really funny because seeing, I, I love having kids and people be like, oh, you know, this is such a great age. Every age is great for different reasons. True. And it's really interesting. Uh, both my kids are, you know, he's wrapping up high school, but both my kids are in high school and it's really interesting seeing them become people mm-hmm. and have like opinions and, uh, you know, he's a very sweet kid. He wears his heart on his sleeve, um, musically inclined. He started playing the saxophone, um, nice. uh, I think in junior high. And I told him like, Hey, I used to play saxophone. He's like, you could teach me. I'm like, Oh, I haven't played in years. <laughs> um, but you know, he loves marching band and it, it's, oh, that's awesome. yeah, I, I love it because I'm like, I remember those days where, it wasn't just hey, I'm playing music. It's I'm playing music and these people become your close friends because with other people. Yeah. This yeah. is something wonderful about that. And it's like, you know, you're not on tour, but you know, you travel to different football games and band concerts. So you kind of have that traveling, you're all on a bus and dealing with yeah. politics and stuff like that. So 
it, and you it, know he's safe. He's like in a you know nice environment. Yeah, like, and it's, it's really that's great. And he's kind of leaning towards going to college for something in the sciences. But I really cool. like that um, he still has that passion for music, and you know, it, it, it's the balance. Like that balance in life, I think, is important. Where Mm-hmm. You know, find what you love, but also have something to do that maybe isn't work, you know, because exactly. Like, well, so that's a, a good, qu- I mean, Inebri Art started because of there was this art movement that came out of LA called um, Drink and Draw Social Clubs. And it was professional artists who were kind of like, we used to do this for fun and now it's all work. So they would get together once a week at a bar to have a couple of drinks and draw and the one rule was you can't bring anything that is technically work. So it's just, Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so we started a branch here in Plymouth again, just artists getting together and hanging out and, and having some drinks and, and just drawing kind of nonsense. It, it was just fun and silly. Do you ever have that point where music starts to feel like a grind and, and more work than fun? Um, it, it gets to that point when I have, uh, like we mentioned earlier, chores, you know, um, mm-hmm. all the things that are not necessarily music, but that are essential to the, to my career. That's when it gets like, Oh, it's not so much fun. I would rather be making music than, you know, um, all the email and all the business stuff. And, and, you know, I've, although I really like the business aspect of it, um, sometimes, <laughs> but other than that, the, the music itself, it never really feels like ever, like, yeah, you know, or, does, do you ever get that point where like someone's going to figure out I'm having fun doing this and the fun's going to go away? <laughs> uh, I hope they know I'm having fun. <laughs> I think that's what makes it, that's what makes it um, work. You know, yeah. is when, when people, um, uh, know that you're enjoying it. And I think I started really reaching um, people's ears when I started making music for myself and not wondering how it was going to be received. Yeah. That's when I started really getting um, more listeners. It, it, it's funny. Um, like I said, we run a lot of local events and, and our main goal is to try and just ex- help expose people in the arts to people who aren't in the arts. And, and each year we're kind of expanding more. Like we, we ran a concert for the first time in January. Um, but uh, you know, like it gets to the point where people be like, come up to us and be like, Oh, thank you so much. And you'd be like, for, for what? And it's mm-hmm. like, I'm just doing it. Cause I think it's fun. Like I'm yeah. like, I tend to forget that people are enjoying it or, or connect with it in a specific way. So it's, well, it's similar to sports, you know, when you think about it, you watch your favorite teams play and you're cheering them on and, but they're not doing it for you. You know, they're, they're not doing it for the audience either. Um, I think, I think there's, there's a lot more in common between sports and, and music than, than we, the way we look at it, but it's, it's so similar to me. Do you have fans come up and, and, you know, tell you stories about like connecting with them in, in ways that you've never thought would happen or, or yeah. kind of flattering that kind of thing. Or Yeah, of course. It, it's always overwhelming. And I've always feel so uh, honored, you know, just, just knowing that people even listen to the music it's, to me, it's still a big deal. Yeah. Uh, I was, we interviewed, um, now he's a friend, uh, uh, Jackson Weatherby of the elevators. And he said that one of the things that blew him away was when one of their first tours, like he leaned into the crowd and the crowd was singing music back to him. That mm-hmm. he's like, I don't know these people. And now they're singing my yeah. song back to me. And he's like, it was just really yeah. surreal. Or, or uh, you know, what I, what I've loved is um, also people telling me about a song in particular, what that song has um, reminded them of in terms of something they went through or, or what it means to them and their interpre- interpretation being completely, completely different from what I was thinking of writing the song or, you know, being completely not quote unquote off 
from what the story is. Yeah. And that is, to me, that is a win because it means that it, I, I, you know, I can use my own personal story and my own personal experience but the song, it doesn't belong to me once it's out. It's for everyone's own interpretation. And when I hear that it's applicable to someone else's story, um, that's, that's, that's the best compliment I can get. Even if it's completely different from the story you were trying to tell? Of course, because everyone has their own story, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's... I don't want them to think about me and my story when they hear the song. It just should be thinking of themselves and how it makes them feel, you know? Uh, it makes me think of um, the song Alive by Pearl Jam. Mm -hmm. Eddie Vedder talks about how, like, it was not a happy song, but the fans have kind of reinterpreted it, and it has actually changed mm -hmm. the song for him. Do you, wow. Do you ever Thanks. have that kind of, like, where it starts to these stories that people tell you kind of in change the meaning of the song to you? Well, like, okay. For instance, Twilight, the, my single that just, that came out recently. Um, it's funny because I, I had to, you know, write some words about what the song is about. And it's, it is about like transitions and, and saying goodbye to something and a relationship ending, for instance. And, you know, I said that, it was taken for everyone else. I was like, this is a breakup song. This is a sad breakup song, yeah. but I'm happily married. You know, I'm not, it's not, <laughs> you know, like my husband and I did the video yeah. together for the breakup song that I wrote. So clearly it's not about me. So, and that's, that's you know, and that, that's what's cool. It's, you know, is that you can still write a breakup song that, a song that means breakup and sadness and a dead relationship to other people when it's not the case for yourself. You know, that that's when I think I'm happy with my work, you know? And he's probably reading that description going, what the hell? <laughs> no, he's just laughing about it because, you know. Yeah. Uh, so is your husband a musician? No, he's not, but he's very musically inclined and he works in the business. So oh, okay. I was, I was going to say like, how does that, work you know going on tour and like is he understanding for all the he travels as much as i do with his oh, own okay. work yeah he has a uh he's a partner of an event company event oh, nice. so they have um they have an, a party called everyday people that kind of translates into a mini festival and oh, cool. um they have events all over the world and they, they always have live bands and he does the production for it so he knows all the lingo in terms of like, he helps me with backline, you know, for instance, he knows like backline lingo more than I do, for instance. Uh, and he travels as much as I do, if not more. Yeah. So he kind of gets the whole lifestyle and, and totally does. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that can always be difficult if someone. Again. Yeah. I can imagine. So where can our listeners go? I mean, obviously they can find you on Spotify, but like where, mm -hmm. where else can people go to find your music and, and what else? Your 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 new music videos and your music video career. That's you know. <laughs> uh, well, all streaming platforms. Uh, it's Adeline A D E L I N E. So all the music's under that name. Same for Instagram. It's at Adeline. Um, I clearly, you know, of course, have a Facebook as well uh, and YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. Um, you can see all the videos. And if you go on my Instagram, there's a link in the bio, and then. Very important to follow artists on Spotify. I don't know if you knew about that, but it, oh, yeah. it does make yeah. Yeah. so follow me on Spotify. Because then they can then you can get more bookings and we can see you Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of those um like I'll jokingly say to people, uh, you know, friends or whatever will find out I have a podcast and they'll be like, Oh, you know, whatever. And I'm like, yes, you know, subscribe and download. I'm like, I don't even care if you listen, just download it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. That's it, true. It, yeah. It, it's, it, it's crazy how analytic driven business can be. Yeah. You know, but numbers. Yeah. It's just part of life. Um, yeah. So do, do you think the numbers come as long as you put out good content? Do you think the numbers will come eventually? 
Yeah, I do think that if the product is good and if you're really coming from a a real place, that there's there's there are going to be people that connect with it. It's it's gonna work. Nice. Well, again, I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, Thank you. And uh, I'm. The more musicians I talk to, the longer the list of music, of music I have to now go listen to. So yes. I, I will go back and, and make the additions and, and get out there and, and expand my listenership. But I think that's one of the things that I really like is to find out not only you know about your music, but what you're listening to. And of course. Yeah. What it's for. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thanks again. And uh, when we put up the podcast, it, it'll probably be a few weeks because we've been recording a lot, but um, we'll, uh, we'll tag you in it so you can know about it. Awesome. And tell people, I'll tell people to listen to it. Not just. <laughs> well, that's why I tell my friends. I'm, my friends don't want to hear me talk. <laughs> I, I say the same to my friends. <laughs> yeah. Especially like um, my editor and producer who like will hang out, you know, go out for dinner or whatever. And it's dead quiet at the table. And people are like, are you guys like mad at each other? I'm like, no, he listens to me talk more than any other human being. Oh, my. Sh- oh, I'm just- oh doesn't my want to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, awesome. Uh, this is a lot of fun. And I uh, hope you and your family stay safe and healthy and get back on the road as soon as you can. Yes, I hope so. You as well. You take care. And thank you so much again for having me. No problem. Have a good Bye-bye. one. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, you can find us on all social medias at Inebriart, except for Instagram, we're at Inebriart6. You can email us with your questions, complaints, and whatnot at Inebriart at yahoo.com. And if you're looking for more podcasts, you can check out the other podcasts on our network, uh, Retro Redoctopus, uh, America's Hometown Horror, and, of course, Bar Talk, Old Colony, and Inebriart Podcast, the original Um, So check those out and subscribe and comment so we can reach more people. And thanks for listening.